many students, when they begin to study the Gnostic teachings, struggle because the scope of this wisdom is vast and very deep. The presentation of Gnosis, which is given in the series of lectures that we've been delivering to you, always comes from the point of view of the absolute. So when we give a lecture here, we start, we begin by discussing the absolute or that profound unknowable. And of course we see that symbolized in the tree of life at the very top of the tree as the Ain and the Ain Sof and the Ain Sof Or. That absolute abstract nothingness is at the base of everything. So when we discuss Gnosis, we always start there for that reason. And many students complain. <laughs> many students have a difficult time understanding why we have to study the absolute. Why do we study something that is unstudiable? Why do we analyze something that is unknowable? <clears throat> and this is a good question. And it obviously demonstrates the willingness of the student to investigate, to not merely accept, but to comprehend, to understand. Clearly, the absolute or what in Buddhism is called emptiness or void is a central aspect of every religion. We find that same phenomena or that same non-phenomena in every mystical tradition, symbolized in different ways. So it is a core aspect of any kind of religious or mystical approach. To life. In particular, when you study Buddhism, you understand that emptiness is the very foundation of Buddhism. And it seems that many students of Buddhism do not fully understand that. Many followers of the Buddha make Buddhism into an ism or a way of behaving, a way of believing. And that is not what real Buddhism is. And in the same way, Christianity is treated when it becomes a belief or any other ism, a way of thinking and a way of seeing, which is not based in experience. Now, the absolute, that unmanifested, that primordial root, is the core of both of these traditions. But it's much easier to see that when you study Buddhism. Because in Christianity, it's more heavily veiled. The Buddha, Shakyamuni, taught his doctrine on many levels, <clears throat> according to the levels of the listener. But universally, in the varying levels of teachings that he gave, he always taught the inherent emptiness of everything. That is the root and core of Buddhism itself, is that emptiness, that void. So in the same way, in Gnosis, we always discuss the absolute. We always have to bear that in mind when we study. In Buddhism, one of the core presentations, one of the core elements of Buddhism is the Four Noble Truths. These Four Noble Truths encapsulate the path itself. And in one of the sutras, we read this verse. <clears throat> it is through not understanding, not realizing, 
four things that I, disciples, as well as you, had to wander so long through this round of rebirths. And what are these four things? They are the noble truth of suffering, the noble truth of the origin of suffering, the noble truth of the extinction of suffering, and the noble truth of the path that leads to the extinction of suffering. These four noble truths provide the essential foundation upon which you have to understand gnosis. That one's okay. It's just the noise here. The first noble truth tells us that suffering is everywhere. That all manifest creatures suffer. Life itself is suffering. Life as we know it. And that is a universal truth for all beings, for all creatures. The comprehension of that one truth would cause radical changes in our every moment, in our every behavior. But we do not comprehend that truth. So we have to proceed and understand what that truth means and how to change it. By investigating that, we're looking at the second truth, which is the origin of suffering. We have to investigate what is that origin. How does suffering arise? Where does it come from? Thirdly, if we're seeking the origin, we must in turn be seeking the end or the extinction, the cessation of suffering. And to find the cessation of suffering, there must be a way, and that is the fourth truth, that path. When we look at suffering itself, to investigate what suffering means, we will find that all suffering can be classified according to three types. There is firstly what in Buddhism they call the suffering of suffering. And this is just pain. Physical, emotional, mental. The type of pain that is very easy to see. But the type of pain that we all know from having illness, Uncertainty, doubt, lack of food, lack of love. These all produce the suffering of suffering. We have the second type, which is the suffering of change. This type is a little more subtle. The suffering of change is that suffering of impermanence. We feel hungry, so we eat. But soon we'll be hungry again, and we'll suffer. And that's the suffering of change. In the West, actually all over the world now, this type of suffering is very stimulated by our culture. Because we suffer due to not having something that we want. We want to have a nice car. And because we don't have that, we have a crappy car. We have an old car. We suffer. We suffer emotionally. We may suffer physically. Maybe the car is uncomfortable. Maybe it's painful to ride in. Maybe it's costing us a lot of money. And so we suffer having to work to maintain that car. And we suffer because we want a better one. But the nature of the suffering of change is that we may achieve getting a nicer car and we'll be happy for a few minutes. But of course, we know that after a short period of time, that new car will cause us to suffer in new ways and we will not be happy anymore. We may want a new job. The job that we have made us happy for a while and then new circumstances arise, new causes and new conditions, and causes us to suffer 
in a different way. So, of course, it makes us want a different job. And so we run like a hamster in a wheel from suffering to suffering. Unfortunately, the psyche that we have believes that somehow at that horizon line that we see up ahead, there is this plateau where suffering will cease, where we will get all of the objects and circumstances that we need in order to have happiness. And so we keep running towards that horizon line, which we think is a plateau. And we keep saying to ourselves, if I can only get a better job, if I can only get a better boss, if I can only get a better apartment, or a better spouse, or a better friend, better clothes, more money, more respect. Once I get that promotion, then I will be happy. This is what we call a delusion. It is not real. This delusion is produced by what we call the I, the ego, the sense of self. The suffering of change is experienced by all beings. All creatures suffer from this form of suffering. We believe that with the application of religion, of beliefs, of theories, of ideas, of material wealth, that we can reduce or eliminate these two forms of suffering. We believe that if we adopt the right lifestyle, the right religion, the right education, the right friends, the right relationships, then by accumulating those things, we will transcend the suffering of suffering and the suffering of change. And yet, there is absolutely no evidence that it is achievable. There is no person who exists, or who has ever existed, who has transcended suffering by the accumulation of beliefs or material pleasures. Such a person does not exist. <clears throat> There's a third type of suffering which is the suffering of conditioning. This is the cause of the first two forms of suffering. We are conditioned by our own mind. The consciousness that we have is trapped within psychological elements. And as such, that consciousness is conditioned by those elements to think and feel according to that conditioning. The consciousness that is trapped inside the egos of envy is conditioned to think and feel that if I can get what that other person has, then I will be happy. This is the suffering of conditioning. And 97% of our consciousness is trapped within the suffering of conditioning. And because we believe in the conditioning of our own consciousness, we accept that conditioning and we listen to it. We, in turn, suffer the suffering of change and the suffering of suffering. The Four Noble Truths express the existence of these types of suffering. But those Four Noble Truths also explain that there is a way in order to overcome suffering, to change to investigate the origin of suffering and to find the way to end suffering. 
to have the cessation of suffering. And that way is the fourth truth, which is the path. That cessation, or end of suffering, is given the label or term nirvana. This simply means liberation. It means liberation from suffering. But in, in specific terms, it means the liberation from the conditioning of the subjective psyche. So nirvana is entered into in levels. Nirvana is a term that's also used for a place, or actually a series of places. But in the context of our psychological state, nirvana refers to a state of consciousness within which the consciousness itself is being freed from conditioning. Nirvana, in that way, does not merely refer to those first two types of suffering. To achieve nirvana does not mean that we simply achieve the cessation of physical pain and the cessation of the suffering of change. Which means that we may belong to a religion or a belief or have the idea that by performing certain kinds of practices, we will enter nirvana. This is fundamentally false. Nirvana is a state of consciousness. And the entrance into nirvana within oneself requires that one overcomes that third type of suffering, which is conditioning. To change the conditioning of one's own mind is a conscious process that requires conscious understanding of the conditioning itself. That conditioning can only be changed when you know what it is, when you know how you are conditioned and why. Only knowing the how and why can you not repeat the mistake. So in order to not repeat our mistakes, to not suffer the way that we suffer. We have to investigate the cause of suffering within ourselves to find out what in us produces the suffering that we have. This requires a very practical, very grounded, very sincere approach. And the most uh, basic tool that we need to apply is the understanding that everything that exists is based on causes and conditions. Now again, this seems very logical, seems very simple. So we say to ourselves, well, I understand that. Everything exists because of causes, and then we forget about it. It is not that simple. This is not something that you can just think for a moment in your intellect. To investigate the cause of suffering is to investigate from moment to moment, to have comprehension or real understanding is beyond the intellect. It's beyond any thought. It is a real understanding that exists within your very atoms, in the depths of your being. Now, understanding that everything depends on causes, if we understand that idea intellectually, we have to take that a step further and say, I myself, as I am now, am here because of causes. So what are those causes? What caused me to be who I am? To answer that question requires sincerity. It requires honesty. And it requires investigation. All manifested entities 
from the atom to the universe are manifest because of causes and conditions. There is nothing that exists in and of itself. Everything depends on other things. So you may say, well, here I am in my body. And we have to investigate that. The body that you have exists because of causes and conditions. Firstly, it exists because you have a mother and a father. And because of causes and conditions which brought them together. And causes and conditions which allowed a birth to occur and allowed you to be born and to grow and to develop. We see in that brief examination millions of causes and conditions which are inconceivable to the intellect. But even in this moment, there are causes and conditions which support your very existence. The stability of matter in the physical world being the first one. If physical matter were not manifest, your physical body would not be here. If you were not able to eat and get food, you would not be here. So there are many causes and conditions which in their combination give rise to this physical body that you have. This is important because it demonstrates that the physical body cannot exist on its own. It's impossible. It can't exist as an isolated entity. And this is true of everything. Nothing can exist without anything else. Because of, that, because of that, we study the law of karma. Karman is a Sanskrit term which means act. Karma is the law of action and consequence. It is a law that manages energy and matter on every level that exists. Now, it's interesting looking a little bit to compare with materialistic science or physics. Because the way of nature, nature works in a series of laws. And these laws apply in varying levels of life. And that's why we study the Kabbalah, or the tree of life. When the, the, the uh, mechanical physics examines the nature of physical matter, they've discovered that there is a certain law that manages energy. And they call this law a law of conservation or invariance. This is an important law in physics, and it reflects a law that exists on every level of life. Invariance is really another word that explains the law of karma. And this law of conservation in physics basically says this. It says, in any physical process, the total energy before must equal the total energy after the process is concluded. What that's saying is that if you have a given quantity of energy, let's say 100, and then a physical process occurs, at the end of that process, nature will equilibrate the energy so that it will be exactly the same at the end. We can see this quite clearly if you look at the action of waves on water. If you take a body of water and you apply a wind or some kind of energy to that water, waves will be produced. They will rise and sink. But in the end, the water will reach the exact level at which it began. This is a physical demonstration of the law of karma. 
what that tells us is that every action that we perform must be balanced. And it will be balanced by the laws of manifestation, by the laws of nature. Here then we find the law of causes. We are who we are because of causes that we ourselves have produced. As uh, Blavatsky said, karma creates nothing. This is a very important statement. Karma creates nothing. Nor does it design. Karmic law adjusts the effects, which the adjustment is not an act, but a universal harmony, tending ever to resume its original position, like a bow which bent down too forcibly rebounds with corresponding vigor. Karma creates nothing. We are the ones who create action and consequence. So then, when we investigate suffering, we have to investigate the causes that we ourselves have produced. And there are two primary types of causes. One, of course, is our own action both physical and internal. And then the second is delusion. It's clear that if we act in an angry way, we will produce causes. And that Anger will produce consequences. Those actions will produce results. In Buddhism, the Buddha taught very clearly that when any person acts, either physically or mentally or emotionally, when an action is performed, that person creates an imprint on their own consciousness. It is the energy of consciousness within which provides the fuel or force for that action. When that action is performed, there is an imprint or a residue of that action. And that imprint is the balancing factor in that law of invariance or law of karma. So the consciousness itself becomes conditioned. That conditioning is called skandhas, or aggregates, or egos, or eyes. The consciousness becomes trapped within the conditioning of that action. And then that consciousness must receive the consequences of that action. We see that in physical matter. When you take action, the effect is generally immediate. But in chemical matter, you combine certain chemicals, the effect may not be immediate. It may be slow in arising. And this is even more true of actions that are performed emotionally and mentally. We're dealing with more subtle forms of energy. And so the consequences of those actions may be slower to arise. Furthermore, the conditions must exist for those causes to manifest. Causes and conditions are at the root of all manifestation. All the causes may be present, but if the conditions are not right, the action or the consequence cannot arise. You may have all the conditions with you. You may have a match and the matchbox. But if you don't strike them together, the fire cannot be produced. In the same way, you can strike them together, but if the match is wet, that is, the conditions are not right, the 
fire will not be produced. Karma is the same. Causes, which are latent within the consciousness, reside there. Waiting the moment for the consequences to be appropriate for those consequences to manifest. So that that energy can be balanced. Liberation comes when all causes are exhausted. There was a teacher of Buddhism in India whose name was Nagarjuna. And he said, you are liberated when your delusions and contaminated karmic actions are exhausted. That is the basis of liberation. Liberation does not come because of what we believe. We can believe whatever we like, but a car does not fly. Causes and conditions prevent that. We can believe whatever we like, but liberation comes when karmic causes and delusions are exhausted, meaning they're removed. We can read all the books that we want. We can fill our minds with theories, and with ideas. But this cannot produce change. Action produces change. Ideas are just ideas. What produces change is to remove causes and karmic conditions. We have to understand that any situation that we go through is a result of our own creation, our own actions. Any situation, every moment, we are what we are because of what we have done. And what we do now is setting up the causes and conditions for what we will become. So the student is encouraged to be very sincere and analyze action in every moment. To learn how to act in the right way. How to think in the right way. The basis upon which we change is in comprehension of our own action. Most of the time, when things go wrong, when we're suffering, we have physical pain or we have emotional pain, we blame someone else. If our job is no good, we don't like our job, people at our job are making us suffer, we blame them. My boss is terrible. My coworkers are crazy. They make too many demands of me. It's an unhealthy environment. They're plotting against me. They're manipulating me. They're using me. My boss is too proud. He's too angry. She's too manipulative. She takes me for granted. We say all these things of our spouse, of our friends, of our coworkers. All the while, we maintain ourselves as pure and separate. That is delusion. And that is one of the causes of suffering. When we see ourselves as pure and separate, it is because we have pride. And because we are not being sincere. The basis upon which we can change is to become sincere and to look honestly at how we ourselves have created that situation, to never blame anyone else. We are the creators of our own destiny. We become what we 
think, what we feel, and how we act. Now, all suffering that we experience is arising because of the conditioning of the consciousness. Because the consciousness itself is trapped within these karmic elements. So the basis upon which we can change our suffering is the consciousness itself. We have to look at the use and function of the consciousness in us from moment to moment to learn to use it in the right way. And then we can learn to change suffering. Changes made in the intellect have no impact. Changes made in the emotional center have little impact. Today, we may believe very much in Gnosis. And tomorrow, we won't. And last year, we didn't. And where do we see change? Do we see real change in our suffering because of beliefs? because of ideas, because of theories? Do we remain a victim of uncertain circumstances, death, illness, doubt, uncertainty, anger? Ideas, beliefs, are very limited in their effectiveness. We have to change, instead, our way of perception to change how we perceive is extremely difficult. But that is the nature of the path itself. The way we change our suffering begins with how we perceive. The mind that we have is a collection of delusions. It is pride and anger and envy and fear, gluttony, resentment, jealousy. And each one of those elements has consciousness trapped within it. And the consciousness trapped within perceives, but through a distorted lens. And that is delusion. To learn to perceive without the distortion of the ego is the foundation of liberation. We have to learn how to liberate the consciousness from the ego. Right now. Not in the future. Not when another Buddha comes. Not when another Savior comes. Not when we have more money or we have more time. Now. The only thing that exists is this moment. There is no future. Where is it? Can you show it to me? Can you show me the past? They don't exist. The only thing that exists is now. If you don't work to liberate yourself now, you never will. Don't suffer from the disease of tomorrow. Learn how to perceive now to perceive without delusion. This perception <laughs> requires that we extract the free consciousness and learn how to use it. Fortunately for us, we still have some free consciousness. We still have a seed, an element inside of us which can produce the causes for liberation. The mind cannot produce the causes for liberation. The mind, the ego, in other words, can only produce suffering. If you take gnosis into your mind, into your intellect, and leave it there, you will create more suffering for yourself and for others. If you take the wisdom of the Buddhas and the angels and the prophets, and you store it in your mind and leave it there, you will create suffering, because that is all the mind can do. To create 
the causes and conditions for liberation, those wisdom teachings must be taken into the consciousness, the free consciousness, what in other words we call the essence, the buddhatta, the tathagata garbha, that is the Buddha nature, the seed or the embryo of the soul. Everyone has Buddha nature, but that does not mean that everyone is a Buddha. It means that everyone has the capacity to become a Buddha, and a Buddha means an awakened one. Everyone has that capacity to become awakened, but not from the mind. from the essence, from the consciousness. That which one feels in the deepest part of one's own being is the only thing that can experience that directly, is the only thing that does not suffer. That which suffers in us is that which is trapped in the wheel of samsara. That which does not suffer is on the other side of the river, and that is called the being. The essence is a part of the being. To escape and transcend suffering is to step towards the other side of the river and to abandon all concept of I. The truth of the path to cessation of suffering involves uh, the development of a very refined state of consciousness. And this state of consciousness is the wisdom of emptiness, the wisdom of the absolute. The development of this state of consciousness is, is realized, is approached by the comprehension of the Absolute. And that's why we always talk about it. The Buddha taught what's called the middle way. The main reason, or the main definition of the middle path, or middle way, has to do with perception. Many people interpret it as having to do with being in the middle of renunciation and great wealth. And it's true it has that application, but only on a superficial level. The ultimate level of the term middle way or middle path refers to how we perceive. In Tibet, there are two primary terms that are used to describe certain practices which one learns and practices in order to reach that form of perception. And these two terms are Mahamudra and Dzogchen. Mahamudra means the great seal in Sanskrit. And Mahamudra is a type of meditation, a type of practice that members of the Kagyu and Gelug sects of Tibetan Buddhism practice in order to understand emptiness. In the Nyingma school, they practice Dzogchen, which is the same thing. It means the great perfection in Tibetan. Many people hear of these practices, and they hear of Gnosis, and they hear that these teachings are a quick and easy way to reach enlightenment. And that by practicing Gnosis and practicing Dzogchen and Mahamudra, they can realize and become self-liberated in one lifetime. And that's true. But the misconception is they think it's easy. And they think it can be done without meditation. And this is not true. Neither the Buddha nor Samael on Vyor nor Jesus, nor Krishna, came to teach 
that you can do a couple of rituals and pray a couple of mantras and ring some bells and you'll be liberated. None of them taught that. Every one of them taught that the path is extremely difficult. Jesus did not come to simply say that we need to believe in him to be free. If that were really the case, then why not just say it and leave it at that? But nowhere in the Gospels did he say that. Instead, he said we have to be perfect. He said that very clearly. We have to be perfect. And one does not reach perfection through a belief. One reaches perfection through action. He taught instead that we have to work on ourselves and remove all imperfection from within our minds. But unfortunately, many people who claim to follow his teachings ignore that. Likewise, in Gnosis, there are many Gnostics who believe that they can reach self-realization without studying the Kabbalah. They believe they can reach self-realization without learning how to meditate. And unfortunately, they're mistaken. The Kabbalah is the language of the teachings themselves. How can you understand the teaching if you do not speak the language? The Absolute is the primordial ground from which all creation manifests itself. How can you understand creation if you do not understand its basis? How can you understand Gnosis if you do not understand the Absolute? You cannot. You have to work to comprehend, to understand intuitively what it means, what is emptiness, what is the Absolute. This understanding is beyond the intellect. The Absolute itself is beyond the mind. It is beyond the self. It is beyond the personality. It is beyond the being. Your intellect can never approach it. So how can you expect to approach Gnosis through your intellect? You cannot. You can prepare yourself. You can learn. But the true comprehension of life comes through meditation, through comprehension. In meditation, we learn to activate the consciousness itself and to use it as a tool, as a means of communication, as a means of understanding, which is beyond the mind. The Buddha said, through mindfulness, we experience interbeing which means everything is in everything else. Therefore, one should know that perfect understanding is embodied in a great mantra, the highest mantra, the unequaled mantra, the destroyer of all suffering, the incorruptible truth. And this mantra is gate, gate, paragate, parasangate, bodhisvaha. This mantra is from what the, is commonly called the Heart Sutra. It's really the Prajna Paramita Sutra. And this mantra says, gone, gone beyond. And what it means is, gate means gone, which means gone from suffering, or in other words, liberation. Gone from forgetfulness or ignorance, into wisdom, to understanding. 
gone from duality into non-duality. Paragate means gone all the way to the other shore. So this mantra is a magical phrase, which means that we have to go beyond ourselves, beyond the mind, beyond the intellect. Parasamgate means everyone all beings. Bodhi is the light inside or the wisdom of enlightenment. And svaha is a cry of joy or excitement. So gone, gone, gone all the way over, everyone, gone to the other shore, enlightenment, hallelujah, is the meaning of the mantra. This is a mantra of profound compassion. But it is a mantra that is used by Buddhists the world over to order to comprehend emptiness. To comprehend that nothing exists in and of itself and that all existing things are inherently empty. And what is in all in existing things is the absolute. This mantra is used in meditation and from moment to moment throughout the day in order to soak the mind, to soak the heart, to envelop the consciousness with the energy of this mantra. This mantra in the sutra is spoken by Avalokiteshvara, who is the cosmic Christ whose existence is on behalf of all beings due to compassion. And so the use of this mantra, gate gate paragate, parasam gate bodhisvaha, is an invocation, is a calling out to that wisdom energy of the Christ in order to help us understand emptiness, to understand that suffering has an end. That suffering in itself has no basis, and so we should not be identified. The way to comprehend suffering is the fourth noble truth, that path. And the Buddha Shakyamuni taught that path has eight aspects. The path really means, a path is a road, a path is a way that we walk. And this path is the way out of suffering. It's the way to transcend suffering inside of oneself, to liberate one's own consciousness, to step outside of the cage that we ourselves created. The path has three aspects. And again, this is very commonly taught in Buddhism. These three are view, meditation, and action. These three are one. These three are the path. You can say that these three are a triangle in the same way that we visualize and imagine the Logos or the Cosmic Christ as a triangle. It's three arms or three points which make one thing. The Eightfold Path that the Buddha taught begins with the very first step, which is right view. And of course, view is one of these three primary aspects of the path. Now, the eightfold steps, the eightfold path, 
are really just these three steps expressed in more detail. The first two steps are embodied in view. Likewise, the next ones are broken down into meditation and action. Right view is the first step. And in one of the sutras of the Buddha, he says this, What is right view? It is the knowledge of suffering, the knowledge of the origin of suffering, the knowledge of the cessation of suffering, and the knowledge of the way of practice leading to the cessation of suffering. This is what's called right view. But of course, that's just the Four Noble Truths. Right view or right seeing, the sutra is translated from the language Pali, which is the ancient language of India. And right view is Samaditi. And that translates as seeing things as they really are. And it's a singular term. So you can't say right views because that's not right. There's one way to see things as they are. And that one way is to see all things from the point of view of emptiness, of the absolute. There are not different opinions. There are not different ways to look at things. There's one way, and that is right view. This has nothing to do with the intellect. It has nothing to do with beliefs. It has nothing to do with whatever school we belong to, whatever religion we like to think about or read about. This has to do with how we perceive. Right view is to learn to see all phenomena as they are. The Gnostic student has to challenge themselves to learn how to do that. And believe me, it is very difficult. To see oneself as one really is, is maddeningly difficult. Because we are so enveloped in delusion. To see external phenomena as they really are, is very difficult to achieve because we are so trapped in delusion. This view is not intellectual. It is not emotional. In fact, it's not even physical. It's intuitive. It's conscious. To have right view is to see without filters, to see without delusions, to see without desire. This means that when you are suffering, when you're in pain, when you're facing circumstances that bother you, you have to learn to see those circumstances without the desire to change them. You have to see them as they are, as they exist, without the desire to alter them, to modify them, to change them, or to escape them. And let me tell you, that's hard. Because as soon as we feel pain, we want to change it. We want to escape it. We want to blame somebody else, and we want somebody to fix it for us. To accept that and to see it for what it is requires great willpower, and it requires great sincerity. But what could be more difficult than that? Well, there is something to do the same thing with pleasant circumstances. To experience any manner of pleasant or enjoyable circumstances without desire, without wanting to keep it, without wanting to extend it or deepen it, without wanting to modify it or adjust it in any way, to see it as it is. This is right view. 
And this is the first step of the Eightfold Path. This is only number one. We haven't even got to number two. The first step is obviously very difficult. But it's something we can begin now. In every moment, to learn to perceive all phenomena without desire. In Gnosis, we have a fancy name for that. It's called self-remembering. Self-observation and self-remembering is the perception of phenomena without the ego, without desire. That is the perfection of the transformation of impressions. To receive all the impressions of life, good or bad, pleasant or unpleasant, without filters, without desire, without wanting to change it or adjust it or alter it, just seeing it as it is. This is called the Tao, to be in the Tao. Now you understand why this path is called the middle way. It is to be in the middle, in between bad and good, pleasant and unpleasant, the extreme views of any kind. Another example would be some people believe that everything that exists is a dream. And other people believe that everything that exists is concretely real. These are two extremes. They're both wrong. The scriptures tell us, see all phenomena as like a dream. Like a dream. The scriptures do not say that everything is a dream. It says everything is like a dream. And that distinction is really important. You have to understand that subtle emphasis. To see that things are like a dream is true because everything is dependent on causes and conditions and everything is impermanent. When we have a dream, most of the time we wake up and we remember the dream and we say, ah, it was just a dream. This is a wrong view. A dream, in the moment we experience it, is real. But it is an experience that's dependent on causes and conditions. Obviously, we have to be dreaming. We have to be asleep physically. And we have to have a state of consciousness that is receptive to the state of dreaming. But when we're back in our physical body, in our day-to-day -day life, we don't see any of that. We say, ah, it was just a dream. A wrong view. Life is like that. Our life as it is now exists because of causes and conditions. If the causes and conditions were changed, we would not have the life that we have. This is not just an intellectual game. This is critical to understanding right view. When you can perceive phenomena whether pleasant or unpleasant, with the understanding that this phenomena that you're experiencing is firstly impermanent. It will not last. Secondly, it's caused by actions that you yourself performed. This means that you yourself can produce new causes which will change that phenomena. That shows you that what you're experiencing is impermanent and can be changed if you know how to act. The understanding and comprehension of that given phenomena, that experience, pleasant or unpleasant, is meditation. It is the analysis with the consciousness of that phenomena. And meditation, in that sense, is in every moment. 
Right view is the way we perceive it. Meditation is how we understand it. Action is how we behave based upon our comprehension. These three are one. They are also eight because they are the Eightfold Path. This point of view, this way of seeing, has to be directed at ourselves, primarily. We need to use it to understand life as it happens around us, without question. But life as we experience it is unfolding because of who we are. We are here and now because of our past action, because of karma. If we want to change that, we have to see who we are. Because who we are produced those causes. By seeing who we are, we're seeing the cage that we've trapped ourselves within. But that's not enough. We can see the cage, but we have to want to change it. This requires meditation. Some Gnostic students develop and grow to the point where they can see their ego. And this is a big step, a very important step, that many students don't reach. But those who reach the direct experience of seeing their own ego have accomplished something very good. But unfortunately, many of them walk away. They become discouraged. They become overwhelmed. They become identified. So to, to see the cage is not enough. We have to see the cage, and then we have to work to destroy the cage. And again, that re relies on application of these three principles of the path, view, meditation, and action. To recognize all phenomena as inherently empty of their own existence is the crucial point of the view. To see that everything that exists is here because of causes and conditions is a step towards comprehension and wisdom. The Gnostic student cannot take anything at face value. The Gnostic student has to learn to inquire deeper, to look into causes and conditions. In Buddhism, they say that there are four hallmarks of correct view. The first one is that the one who has correct view sees that all conditioned existence is impermanent. Now, this is important because by understanding impermanence, we understand that everything changes. This means that the student who sees that their ego is huge and they're trapped in suffering and they're in trouble has to remember that, that this is impermanent. It's possible to change it. Walking away and ignoring the teachings and ignoring the truth of one's situation is foolish. And there's no need for that. Instead, one should realize that the situation can be changed. The second point of view is, or the second hallmark, all deluded experiences are suffering. This is also very important. This means that all experiences through the ego are suffering. Now, many things that we experience now, we like, we enjoy, and we want more of. But they are deluded experiences. And they will produce suffering. We may really enjoy ice cream. But if we keep eating it and enjoying that experience, it will have negative effects on our health. 
Likewise, we may really enjoy talking to our friends. But misuse of that experience can cause suffering for not only ourselves, but for our friends. Every type of experience that we have has to be analyzed from the point of view of emptiness and understood from the point of view of the consciousness. The third hallmark is that all phenomena are empty and lack self-identity. This is further and deeper into understanding the nature of causes and conditions. The ego itself is not real. The psyche that we have is not real. It is lacking real existence. And yet, we protect it. We clutch it. We grasp it. We fight for it. For an illusion. For something that doesn't exist. To develop correct views, to understand that the ego that we have is not real. The sense of self that we have is not real. To find reality requires that we abandon our sense of self. So long as we clutch and grasp onto who we feel we are, who we think we are, we are clutching and grasping onto a delusion which causes suffering for us. The fourth hallmark is that nirvana or liberation is true peace. All four of these, if they remain in the intellect, they are vapor and dust. Correct view is conscious knowledge. To know that liberation is true peace is to have experienced it. To know that the ego is empty of true identity is to have experienced it. To believe it and to think it is fine, but one must work to experience that. These types of suffering that we've analyzed do not end with death. Yes, all phenomena are impermanent, but the nature of that impermanence is that they will cease to be when their energy is equilibriated. A karmic act will dissolve when its energy is dissolved. A karmic consequence, a karmic debt, is removed when its energy is dissolved. The consciousness that we have, which is trapped within the imprints of previous action, must continue in order to enact and experience the results of those actions. The death of the physical body is no obstacle for karma. Energy continues. Action is energy, and it must be fulfilled. Jesus said it. Not one dot, not one iota will be removed until all of the law is fulfilled. Consciousness continues even if the body must be replaced. Suffering continues. Suffering continues beyond death. Just the same way that day follows night and night follows day. We cannot expect that we will escape the results of our actions. Nothing in nature escapes the consequences of action. Neither do we. Death is no obstacle for karma. But the inverse is also true. Liberation and freedom from karma, freedom from suffering, 
can be had. The law says that everyone will receive as he does. What we do produces consequences, and we will reap the benefits of that, good or bad. To change our suffering requires right action, conscious action. So there's two ways to approach suffering. Two ways to deal with suffering. And every being that exists chooses one of these two. The first is unconsciously. We can deal with our suffering unconsciously. That is, we ignore it. We just wait for death. We take on a belief or an idea. We become a member of a school who promises us a glorious afterlife. If we give them the right kind of money, or if we say the right things or believe the right things, then when we die, we will be happy for eternity. And this is a very lovely idea, but it has no evidence. There's no proof. There are no facts. It's comforting, but it's a lie. We can approach our suffering in this way and just say, well, God's in charge. He'll handle it. It's true. There's no question that the laws that manage creation will definitely manage creation. And the laws that manage action and consequence will definitely manage them. But what we fail to realize is that that delusion is causing us to deepen our own suffering and to ignore the possibility for true happiness. To suffer unconsciously means to remain within the ego, to sleep psychologically. But if that person continues that way, they deepen their suffering. If they die, they deepen their suffering. Suffering continues as long as the I exists. I'd like to read to you a quote from Samuel Anvior, which synthesizes this entire lecture. And it says this, that which one feels in the deepest part of one's own being is the only thing that can experience directly that which does not belong to time. That which suffers on this side of the river, here in the wheel of samsara, is what suffers. That which is on the other side of the river is that which does not belong to time. That is that, and you do not know it. The being of the being is beyond the eye and the garden of love, and that which does not belong to time. The being of the being is very far from the body, far from the affections and the mind. What one feels in one's heart, the pain which affects one at a given moment, has its root in time. That which has nothing to do with time is always on the other side of the river. Real plenitude Authentic happiness is found on the other side of the river. Families arise in time. They are lost in time. They are always subjective, unconscious, and suffer much. Groups of humans appear and disappear in time. They are corpses that live. Those shadows of the past are phantoms who cry, who project themselves towards the future to the alley of the present. Many conflicts exist among those shadows of time. What is behind ourselves in the interior of the interior is the being. Only the being of the being can experience the truth directly. The myself is on this side of the river. The being is on the other side of the river. The myself is what is worth nothing. It is perishable. The being is the imperishable, 
that which is always new. The myself is complicated, unconscious, and painful. The being is simple, happy, and conscious. The myself is a knot that we have to untie. The being is perfect plenitude. The diverse circumstances of life do not exist beyond time. To feel what one should feel, what nobody understands, what is unknown by he who feels what is not worth feeling, is in reality being awake. Behind the sentiment that one considers to be so real, which is not, there is another sentiment that people do not understand. The authentic happiness of the being horrifies the ego. That which is felt in the being causes pain to the ego. The being and the ego are incompatible. They are like water and oil. They can never mix. To feel what one should feel is in reality being awake. This is correct view. To be awake, to have the consciousness active and present and analyzing and observing is to have correct view, is to see without desire, to see without willing, without the will to change phenomena, without the desire to alter phenomena. It sounds like a contradiction. Because to change our suffering, we have to change our own minds. But to view phenomena without the desire to change them is to view them in the right way. And this is something that can only be understood through action. The intellect will make a mess of your understanding as long as you leave your teachings in the intellect. The teachings have to be understood intuitively and in action in order for them to make sense. Do you have any questions? Yeah, um, remember when you said that the uh, consciousness, whenever it does something, um, there, there's like a recoil or something of that energy makes like mental formation or whatever? Um, well, what happens if like you remove all that? All action produces consequences, period. All action. The question becomes to act in harmony with nature, to act from the point of view of the action required by the being. That type of action does not trap the consciousness in suffering. On the other hand, it, it helps the consciousness to grow. And that's what happens when we comprehend our own karma and we comprehend an ego or a defect. That energy, that karmic energy, is transformed. And that's why they call tantra the practice which harnesses the forces of desire. Because in reality, the method of tantrism is to comprehend and utilize the energy that's trapped in the ego, to free it and transform it into something good. That's a, that's a kind of magic that only the being can make. Only God can do that. But by learning to act according to his will, we become a part of that process of transforming energy in the right way. And that's how we advance the steps of cosmic evolution. When we act against that will, we act out of self-will or out of delusion, we trap those energies and we create ab uh, like blocks and knots in the flow of existence. And that interrupts not only our own development, but the development of the universe. You get it? It's kind of a big deal, right? <laughs> You have a question? Yeah, um, you're talking about the causes and consequences, like uh, you, you need, or the causes and the conditions, sorry. Like you need certain conditions to arise for that karma to play out. But what about um, 
you know, telepathic egos that ensure that certain situations are going to occur. Is that the karma itself? Is that right? The force of okay, an ego itself is um, an imprint. It's a formation in the mind, which traps energy. That energy wants to act. It has to act because it's energy. It has to move. But that action is adjusted and modified by that conditioning. So what that means is the energy that's trapped inside of an ego of anger wants to express itself. It can only express as anger because it's trapped that way. And it will express in, according, in accordance with how it was created. So if that anger was a fight that you and I had and we're both born in new bodies or whatever, the recurrent nature of the structure of that ego will push that energy to act in the same way it was created, more or less the same circumstances and time. So that force and energy will be pushing to create those same conditions in communication with the other elements that were involved with its creation. So it's very sophisticated. And it's all happening without us having any knowledge. Right, but if we can take that, that moment and transform it to be the same conditions. Exactly. Through the application of wisdom, which means by learning how to have right view, to meditate on that karmic imprint, we can comprehend how we made that. What is the mistake that we made? And in comprehending that, we don't need to repeat it. And in that comprehension comes the right to dissolve that element, which frees that not in existence and frees us from having to repeat that circumstance which is a big deal. Unfortunately, we have a lot of those. Yeah. You know. Yes? When you were talking about um, like meditating on emptiness, I don't understand what that emptiness means. Emptiness is the absolute yeah. in its root. And it's that ground from which everything arises. right? It's the nothingness from which something comes. And when we talk about meditating on emptiness, what we're talking about is how in its root, all phenomena are resolved back to that ground, to that emptiness. And that sounds like, oh yeah, that's an interesting idea. But what does that mean? I mean, it does, how do I make that practical? It's made practical from looking at things from the point of view of where you are now. And where you are now is you're dealing with suffering. You have a situation or a problem that you need to resolve. If you approach that problem as if it were an isolated thing, you cannot fix it. You have to learn to comprehend that that element, that situation, is dependent on causes and conditions, which is like a web. That web itself, each element, depends on all the other elements. So in and of themselves, none of them really exist. And in meditation, that becomes a very important point. The reason we suffer is because we are attached. We have desire. We are attached to a sense of self. We have this I that we believe is real. And when that I is contradicted with painful circumstances, we suffer. When we realize that not only the situation isn't real and it's impermanent, but our own sense of self is not real and is impermanent. That suffering doesn't be, is no longer a problem. The key there is the consciousness can become separated from that event. When you realize that, you no longer need to be identified with the situation or with yourself. And that puts you in a point of view or a position from which you can comprehend the true nature of that situation. You see where I'm going? Yeah. It's subtle, but it's absolutely critical. That point of view is right view. Myself does not exist. The situation does not exist. It exists conventionally. We know we're all here. I know that this physical body is here and it's real and it exists, but it only exists because of causes and conditions. So why be attached? What in me is permanent? What in me is unchanging? The consciousness in its root is that. So meditating on emptiness, meditating on impermanence, 
meditating on death, meditating on karma, all point back towards that same thing, which is the being. We need to learn to access and experience the being from moment to moment, all the time, and that is right view. And from that view, we can then properly and in balance interact with manifestation and not create karma. Kind of a long answer. Uh, do you understand the point that I'm getting at? Emptiness is something that's very difficult to grasp with the intellect. It's something that you have to understand intuitively, and the understanding of that can only come when you meditate. Meditating and meditating and meditating, and then you start to grasp, oh, it's actually simple. It's that middle view, which is like a, I don't know how to put it in words. <laughs> Difficult. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, let's say I, I, I was going to like try to have Craig deal in a certain form, let's say this one, right? Uh, like, I, I wouldn't even know, like, I, I could like start saying, well, this moment is permanent with my intellect, you know? It wouldn't really lead me anywhere unless, I don't know. Like, how do you like really access the consciousness to give you that right view? Does that make sense? No. That's something you have to discover in yourself. The consciousness is the root of your ability to perceive. And that's something that only you can activate 